Hi everybody, this is Pastor Don coming at you once again today in our study of the book of James. And this time I'm not just coming from a corner of the screen, my happy face is filling up the whole screen. It's great to see you. I guess I should say it's great for me to be seen by you because all I'm looking at is the lens of a camera. But I know you're there, and I thank you for watching this video. We're continuing in our study of the book of James. I think this is, what, session seven that we've had together. Hopefully, you've been able to check them out. Now, because I'm not putting the scripture up on the screen, I want you to uh, grab your Bible like I have mine, if you want to, and to uh, follow along as I read it. Remember, if you want to pause the video and grab your Bible, that would be great. I want to remind you that James is all about what it looks like to live life as a follower of Jesus. And his main theme is that if you are a follower of Jesus, it will absolutely make a difference in your life. And today he is going to talk about how to resist the devil and become a friend of God's. Wow, that is two completely different ways to live. So I'm here in chapter 4. I'm going to start by reading the text. Chapter 4, I'll start at verse 1. Did you find your Bible? All right, let's, let's read it together here. Follow along and put your eyes on it as I read it out loud. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother judges him, or judges him, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Well, that's a lot of stuff in there, but what I want us to focus on are where he talks about being a friend of God and what that means, and also resisting the devil and what that means. So here's the first thing that I want us to think about today, and um, 
If you want to be a friend of God, you've got to start by realizing that sin is real, Satan is real, and evil is real. Sin is real, Satan is real, evil is real. You realize that? Now he talks about all of those things in here. Sin, Satan, evil. And, and one of the things that we cannot afford to do is to dismiss this lightly as something that's not important. First of all, let's talk, he talks about the devil. The devil is another way of talking about Satan, God's sworn enemy, who does exist as true and as real as God is, just as true and real as his enemy, Satan. And one of the main ways that Satan wants to get at God is by getting at you, if you're a follower of Jesus. He gets at God by going after God's children. And he is going to go after you. In fact, he might be doing that right now. You have an enemy. The Bible calls him Satan, the devil. Jesus talked about him, called him a liar. He can't be trusted. He wants to destroy you. He's real. Um, so what did we see about him? First of all, we saw that Satan is real. In, in verse 7, it says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So he is real, and he, but he can be resisted, and that's good to know. We don't have to succumb to his temptations. Um, we can resist him. But it starts by taking him very seriously and not, uh, not downplaying that significance of the enemy that you and I have. But not only is Satan real, we live in a world that is fallen. Now I want you to go back to verse 7 again and look at what it says. Uh, no, not verse 7. Verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Well, when, when the Bible, and James here in particular, talks about the world, it's not talking about people. The world is filled with people, and some scriptures tell us that God so loved the world, meaning he loves the people of the world. But when James talks about the world here, he is talking about the evil world system in which we live, a fallen world that has rejected God and gone its own way. So these are the things in the world that draw us away from God instead of toward him. And this is what is true every day in our world. There's temptations that are drawing us away from God. Selfishness, evil, um, uh, lies about what will bring us true happiness. You need more stuff. The lies of materialism. All of these things that are in the world. Greed, pride, anger, the ways of the world, the entertainment of the world the values of the world, many of these are, are drawing us away from God instead of to God. So if you want to be God's friend, you will have to resist these values of our fallen world. So that is a reality that we have to face. And then also, he talks about evil. He talks about sin being real, and he talks about evil being real. And we have to come to the realization that that evil is in us. It's, it's in me. It's in you. It's a reality. Because we have inherited a fallen nature which makes us, uh, by default, sinful and rebellious against God. So he talks about that evil in verses 1 and 2. And he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? He also talks about the battles within you. He talks about wanting something and not getting it, killing, coveting, quarreling, and fighting. There is evil that's in us, and it plays out in our lives. He mentioned evil also here in verse 12 when he said, uh, uh, not verse 12, verse 16, As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. One of the first things we have to realize if we're going to be friends of God is that uh, there is evil in us that we have to address. Have you been able to admit this? Have you taken this seriously? You know, um, a couple of hundred years ago, um, 
a group of Christian people put together a, uh, a teaching tool called a catechism. It's where question, you ask and then answer questions that help students learn what they believe about the scripture and about faith. So this one is the Westminster Catechism, and it asks the question about what is sinfulness all about? And what happened when Adam and Eve, the first human being, sinned? And how does that affect us? And I want you to read this. This isn't something I made up. This has been what Christians have held to for hundreds and hundreds of years about the evil in us. Listen to what it says. So the sinfulness of that state into which human beings fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the complete absence of that righteousness wherein he was created, and the corruption of his nature, whereby he is utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good. And he is completely inclined to all evil and to it continually, which is commonly called original sin. And from that, that evil inside of us, from that proceeds all actual transgressions. So all that evil that we do in our lives, all the outward sins that you can see in our, in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, in our deeds, all of that comes from the evil that is already inside of us by default. And James wants us to know that, that it, it is real and we're, we had better realize that and face it and own up to it. That's a really important first step for all of us to come to realize that not only is Satan real and sin real, but that evil is in us. And unless we get help from God, we're, we're really, really helplessly lost. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to do as much evil as I possibly could, or that every sin ever imagined I'm going to be guilty of. But it does mean that on my own, apart from God's help, I'm going to be completely incapable of becoming a friend of God or changing myself. I need help. Fortunately, we know that God provided that help through Jesus Christ. So let's keep going. We have to realize that Satan is real, that evil is real, and that it's in us. But we secondly have to reject a neutral attitude. What's your attitude about uh, the, the, the conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan? Are you on one side or the other? Or are you just kind of a neutral party? You know what? You can't be neutral. If you say, well, it's not that I'm against God, but I'm not really on Satan's team either. Guess what? You're either on one or the other. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral position. I already read to you how by when we're born into this world, we are by default on the side of Satan, on the side of evil. We are inclined. We have a fallen nature. We're inclined towards all evil. So if you think that you can live life with one foot in both worlds, you are mistaken. That's why James says very clearly, don't you know that friendship with the world is, be it, is to be an enemy of God? You can't, you can't do both. You can't love the world, the evil world system, and be God's friend at the same time. It's one or the other. He gives another example of this in the last verse. He says in verse 17, anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, Sins. See, we've got the knowledge up here, but we live in a totally different way from what we know. We have to reject a neutral attitude. You, you, you're, in, you're on one side or the other, so which is it for you? Do you wish to be a friend of God? Or is the a pull of the world and what, it, what it's offering you, uh, is that taking over you? Which is, which is your true allegiance? Well, if you're going to be a friend of God, you're going to have to reject that neutral attitude where I can have one foot on both sides. I can't. You can't either. Finally, the third thing today that I want us to talk about is that we have to resist. Being a friend of God means resisting the devil by specifically 
specifically choosing God and his ways. <coughs> since there isn't any neutral ground, and since by default we're inclined towards evil, it's going to take a very deliberate and specific change to become a friend of God. And fortunately, God has made it possible for us to be his friends because he sent Jesus Christ into the world so that he would take our sin and, and pay its penalty in his death on the cross. And that just doesn't take away the penalty of our sin. That fills us with a new power to be God's children. It makes us alive spiritually so that we can follow God. We can resist the devil and see him flee from us. We can learn to do life where we're controlled by God's spirit instead of controlled by that inward pull of evil or by the outward pull from the world that's drawing us away from God. We have in Jesus the power to live in a brand new way. And we're going to do that very clearly and specifically when we say, God, I'm not going to be neutral anymore. I want, I want to be completely and totally sold out for you. Sometimes junior hires say, well, I can deal with that later. I'm just a kid. You know what? This is the day that you are becoming the person you're going to be for the rest of your life. And that's why these days, even though you think you're just a kid, you're not. You can choose now to be completely and wholeheartedly on the side of God and Christ. That's my prayer for you today. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You can be God's friend. Let's pray. I thank you, God, for the promise of the scripture that as we resist evil inside of us and outside of us, that you will come in and replace it with yourself so that we can be your people and walk in your ways. I thank you for the scripture that promises us that when we confess our sins, you forgive them. And that when we open our lives to you, you come in and fill every part to change us from the inside out. Thank you for the scripture and for the book of James. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. We got one more session here on the book of James, so be, be tuned for that next week. We'll do our, our final uh, study here and wrap up the book of James. Have a great day, everybody, and I will see you next time.